The views and opinions expressed in the following conversation are those of the guest being interviewed and do not necessarily reflect those of the Decibel Geek podcast, its staff, or contributors to the Decibel Geek blog. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast, Vinnie Vincent Special Part 3, with special guest Robert Fleischman. Here's your hosts, Aaron Camaro and Chris Sinzak. All right, with all formalities out of the way, I guess it's time to get right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Decibel Geek Podcast, where we are celebrating Kissmas in July. Week three. Week three, three in a row. The ties between Vinnie Vincent and the Decibel Geek, Decibel Geek podcast go back to the pretty much the very beginning of the show. It, uh, it, it's, it's BC. It's before Camaro. Before Camaro, indeed. <laughs> so you now Aaron gets to jump on the crazy ride that is doing a Vinnie Vincent special. And this is part three of the Vinnie Vincent special. And like I mentioned before, I wasn't going to do another one of these. Uh, you know, after last year, they were so popular, but at the same time, um, you know, at the same time, I felt like we'd kind of told the whole story, and unless I got something really knockout good for an interview, then I was going to leave it alone. I, I've conducted a few background interviews that, with some other people that were really good, but I was I was considering holding off because it's like the guy's been through a lot, you know, right. and and we're not gonna we're not gonna go into deep stuff on litigation and all that. We did that last time, and what we're gonna focus on tonight is more musical based stuff, but it's more of an in you know more of a behind the curtain look at. Some things that took place with Vinny and a person that worked with him on three different occasions. And if you're a Vinny fan, you definitely know. If you're not a big Vinny fan, this might be some new information. We're going to try to update you on you know, what we're talking about as we split this thing into segments. Today's guest is Robert Fleischman. And a lot of, some people are going to say, who the hell is that? But to most Decibel Geek listeners, they're going to know that Robert Fleischman is the voice on the first Vinny Vincent Invasion album. Right. Not the not the face you saw on the Boys Are Gonna Rock video. That was Mark Slaughter. And we'll get, you, we'll we'll get, get into in all that, that, too. <laughs> There's a lot. And as I said, Robert had a lot to get off his chest. And I want to, well, first off, thank Robert for coming on the show because um, I tried to get him on last year and he was not interested in talking about this stuff. But now he's, uh, you know, he did a Kiss Expo a few months ago in, in Atlanta. And I think that's kind of, and also he has a new project to promote, and we're certainly going to help. And the music you'll, that you're hearing throughout the show is stuff from his new band, The Sky. Great band. I picked up the CD, and you definitely need to pick up that CD, and we'll have uh, information on how you can get it later on in the show. But Robert went uh, was part of an Atlanta Kiss Expo a few months ago, and that's where we're going to start the conversation that you're going to hear. Um, before I get into that, I'll just catch those up that doesn't know what was going on. Phil Elliott of Creatures of the South is the promoter for the Atlanta Kiss Expo, and Phil actually booked um, Vinnie Vincent himself back in the 90s through some American uh, Kiss Expos. And there's a lot of stories behind what happened, how Vinnie acted during the stuff and everything, but the, there's not a lot going on there. But, you know, apparently things did, that went sour as they tend to do with Vinnie. And, uh, but when Phil was ramping up the promotion for this Atlanta Kiss Expo, he started talking about this unannounced surprise guest that was going to be at the, sh that was more than likely going to be at the show. He was very noncommittal about it. Which everybody assumed was Vinny Vincent. All of us on the crazy Kiss and Vinny Vincent message forums were like, oh, you know, because Robert's going to be there. So maybe Vinny will be there. You know, maybe Vinny wants to, you know, get back in touch with Robert. And there's also more on that later in the show. Um, so the person or the unannounced surprise guest never materialized, and so there's still and Phil has never addressed who it was supposed to be, why they didn't show up, which has done nothing but ramp up more speculation of was it really Vinny? And we asked Robert about that, and you'll hear his response to you know who he said was or wasn't supposed to be a part of that um, expo. And I also I re we reached out to Phil Elliott this past week to get an answer from him, told him that we were going to have Robert on the show and he'd be sharing his thoughts on it. And Phil has not, as of the date of this recording, has not gotten back to me. And if he does, I will, I will pass along his response. But uh, I guess we just need to go ahead and get right to it, right, Aaron? I think so. Was that your first convention for Kiss? Or had yes, you... it was my first 
uh, experience um, speaking at the uh, expo. Yeah, the Kiss Expo. Yes. Oh, okay. And it was great. Yeah. It was. It was uh, definitely. You know, I, I felt like I was definitely walking into Gene and Paul's church. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a self-confessed Kiss. Those people kisser. are very, very devoted, and and I mean, it's it's a worldwide phenomenon, you know. Oh sure, yeah. I'm I'm as big a Kiss geek as you'll find. Did you get any uh, out of left field questions you didn't expect on the Q and A part? Um, no, not really, because unfortunately, I I stupidly rambled. <laughs> I just kind of went from one thing to another, filled it all out. Right, right. Well, but I did get a, but I did get people asking, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. But nothing, nothing that I couldn't handle. You know, I know Phil Elliott put that on, and I, uh, I know Phil through Facebook. I've talked to him a couple of times, and I know uh-huh. he was he was hyping it up with some sort of mystery guest that was supposed to show up, and they never did. Do you have any idea of who that person was supposed to be? I think it was supposed to be Eric um, Singer. What's the guy's name? Drummer? Eric Singer. Eric Singer, yeah, it was yeah. supposed to be him. Oh, okay. So, well, Elliot yeah. would have never. He, uh, Elliot, I mean, uh, Phil would never <laughs> work with Vinny again. He's been he's been burned too many times by him. And, and Elliot is a super nice guy, big heart, generous, mm-hmm. and you know he just really did some bad things to him. Yeah, well, I you know I knew he had booked him on conventions back in the '90s, and there were stories that went around, and he. He almost uh, committed to interviewing with me last year about Vinny, but he 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 wanted to hold off. But of course, all the hype started up of who's the mystery guest and is it Vinny? So you know, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, Vinny wouldn't. I don't think Vinny would go to one of those things because I think it would be like the scene in Frankenstein when all the village people have the torches and then <laughs> fall, you know, running up the hill to burn them, right. and that's what it would be. <laughs> Where is my box set? <laughs> so, That's right. Where's yeah. my three hundred and fifty dollar box set? Was that how much it cost? Uh, no, I think it was like. Was it? I heard it was three hundred and fifty. I heard it was one hundred and fifty. The. Yeah. I know a couple of people that they paid for. I think it was like one hundred and twenty-five or something. But there may have been a, like a deluxe version or something that somebody had paid for. Oh, mm-hmm. the deluxe bed over version. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to ask. Well, we'll go back to the beginning of when you met him. Was he already playing with the? with uh, Hirsch and Jimmy in them at the time when you met him? Uh, actually, I guess so, because one, I remember once he asked me to come down to uh, SIR in, in Hollywood, uh, and uh, they had a room there, and I came down there, and I, I met Hirsch, and Hirsch is the drummer, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I met him. Yeah, I, I guess I met that band, mm-hmm. and I went down there, and I played with Vinny and, and, and whatever that, I think, wasn't it called New England or something like that? Well, Hirsch and Jimmy and, I'm, I'm blanking on the other guy's name, they were, yeah, three of, the three of them were basically the, the band New England. And Okay, and then, so I guess it was, you know, some members of them and Vinny uh-huh. and I don't remember who the other people were. Yeah. But and, uh, I went down there and it, uh, it, sounded, it would sound great. Mm-hmm. off the block, you know, just like like if you were like you know, a runner, you just start, you know, off the block, you just bam, start going, and then it would just fall and stumble. I mean, if Vinny was just breaking strings one after another. We just, it, it, we spent more time having him, you know, stringing up his guitar than we did play. Really? Well, so he yeah, was... Yeah, so right then and there, I just kind of go like, ah, this doesn't, this doesn't look too good, you know? So was he... But then... But then later on, you know, he he came to me with some demos, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what kind of started it all, I think. So was he clearly in charge of the project when you met him? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, because those were all his songs. I mean, when right. I met him, he he played me a four four song demo mm-hmm. on a cassette player. Yeah, <laughs> on a cassette, and uh, those were his songs. And he he had them. Uh, I think it was just the instrument. He just had the instrumental. There wasn't any vocals or anything on it. Right. Then later on, he uh, he went in and recorded them. And then uh, I came in and I worked with him and did the vocals on some on them. Now, were you when you were doing the vocals on those songs for the early demos? Were were you just viewing this as I'm lending my vocal talent to this, or I'm going to be in a band with these guys? Um, it was sort of um, my impression we were going to be a band okay and then Vinny comes in one day and says i'm going to be in kiss is that basically how it went 
And then, um, yeah, we, we uh, I can't remember if it was before or after we went in re- and uh, recorded the demos. Mm-hmm. I think we did uh, Shoot You Full of Love. I think we did Substitute. Uh, I can't remember the other one. And then again, I might be wrong. <laughs> Well, yeah, it was a long qu- ago. quite a while ago. Um, th- well, th- was it a, kind of a, sh- a shocker all of a sudden, you know, all this stuff we've been working on and now it's ground to a halt? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we we uh, went in the studio during that time, but I think we're a little ahead of ourselves because I, we we started writing some stuff together and we were, and we did the thing with Hirsch. Mm-hmm. And then after that, he came over and played me the, the, the uh, demos. And then we started writing and putting stuff together. And then he told me that he was going to go. He was asked to play with, with um, Kiss. Okay. And I told him definitely to do it. Right. Because at the time, he was living in a really super small apartment. And he just had twins, mm-hmm. you know, with, with Maria, his wife. Right. And, um, and I said, look, you got to do that, man, because it's just going to take you out of that box. Sure. And, yeah. Um, and you know, spank up your old new life. Exactly. And then, so he did it. Yeah. And after that, I had no, um, I had had no contact with him. Mm-hmm. And then uh, one day he calls me up and tells me that he's no longer with Kiss. And uh, do I want to, you know, spark this thing back up again? All right, welcome back. So, for those that didn't know, that was how Vin, that was basically the early days, right when Vinny got put into Kiss, and uh, Robert's thoughts on working with him before things kind of fell apart. And uh, then he doesn't hear from Vinny, and then Vinny says, "Hey, let's start this up again." Aaron, what what are your thoughts on the, hearing that first part there? Well, you know, it's kind of like you know, from the lowest lows to the highest highs, you know, the top mm-hmm. of the mountain and right back down again, right, you know, back to square one. And it's kind of tough because in a situation like that, you, you feel for Vinny Vincent. I know I do. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's and you you could tell that you know, as glamorous as that spot seemed, you know, to be the guy replacing Ace Frehley and Kiss. Vinnie Vincent really didn't have it as good as you would imagine a rock star in that position would. Mm-hmm. Because you've got to remember, he's just an employee of Gene Simmons and yeah. Paul Stanley Incorporated. And I've I've talked to you off air about this before, because we are real KISS geeks, because we talk about this stuff on our own time, <laughs> where, <laughs> not just on the air, well, where my my thought of it always I don't, been... I don't need to clock in to talk about KISS. Oh, no, we're always on clock. <laughs> but... Uh, if you read the great book by C.K. Lent, Kiss and Sell, he goes into a lot of great detail about yep. Vinny's situation in the band. Where they kept him in a dumpy-ass hotel. He was, and... I mean, if you read that, it, he was not treated you know, very well. He was treated as an employee. And then also, at the same time, Vinny's ego was too much for Kiss at the time. Because you got to understand, Kiss had lost Peter Chris, who had a lot of ego issues at the time of right. 80. Then Eric Carr gets brought in. Eric Carr, as great as his contribution was, was not going to rock the boat. He appreciated the opportunity he was right. given. He you was know, more he of a knew. he was more of an agreeable character. He knew where his bread was buttered. Vinny Vincent, on the other hand, he, in my opinion, always had the psyche and the 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 mental buildup of a band leader. Not a, he's right. not not a follower. And Paul and Gene, you have to understand, were probably highly gun shy at this time after what they went through with Ace. Well, you got to figure, and all you got to do is look at that Tom Schneider interview one time and look at, you know, what they were dealing with in a in a personality like Ace Frehley. Yeah. Now, when they re- go to replace Peter Chris and Ace Frehley, they want guys that they can keep under their thumb, sure. you know, and say, "You are our employees. We are going to treat you like our, you know, mm-hmm. subordinates." And you will be subordinate well, to us, you know, and, and that's the way it is. And if you don't like yeah. it, hit the road, you know. Well, and, you know, and I can see both sides of it because I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've read the stuff about Vinny and Eric having to cut their pay, cut their salary like in half during that period. Because yeah. you also got to understand Kiss was at their financial low point during this time. Because as much reverence, reverence and, you know, love for Cre- the band, the, for the album Creatures of the Night that the band gets from fans nowadays after what they went through with Unmasked and the Elder, they, I mean, they were they were popularity at their low point. New Wave was huge. The new wave of British heavy metal was big. Everyone well, was into plus, Maiden I mean, and Priest. And the big thing is, the main thing was, I think they lost Peter, Chris, and Ace Frehley. I think that did well, a, just a huge amount of damage to that band because yeah. it took away the dynamic 
that made him big. I mean, I think if, if Peter, Chris, and Ace Frehley were able to have stuck in it out, you know, were able to make things work within the band, I think they would have been able to bounce back from, you know, the elder and the unmasked, like you said, a lot faster than Kiss did without him. Yeah, but uh, so, yeah, the, I mean, that, that leads you up to what Robert said there was, you know, obviously he was going to support a friend of his, right. even, even though he was working on some great demos, and some of those demos wound up being the first Invasion album, as you'll find out later. Right. Um, you know, you can't, I'm mean, Vinny had yeah. just had new twin daughters. He you was can't broke. say no to that gig. You can't say no to that. And if it was even somebody I was working with, I would say, yeah, go for it, man. That's, you know, that's a dream come true. But then as you see, personality conflicts rise up. You have to see both sides of this. You can't right. just say it's Vinny being an egomaniac, or you can't just say it's Gene and Paul being egomaniacs. There was <laughs> it's too, a whole lot of egomania going on. There was too much on. ego for one band at that time. For sure. So anyway, the, the, so Vinny get lo leaves Kiss or gets fired, depending on whose story you believe. Or though Vinny never officially was a member of Kiss, if you you know according right. to Gene legally. So Vinny starts up the project with Robert, and now in this next section, now we're going to get into some real stuff here. You're going to get into some real kind of cloak and dagger drama here with what happens when Robert starts working with Vinny again. This is also where Dana Strum in enters the picture. So yeah, you're going to hear. In this segment, a bit, a little bit about the demos for the Invasion album. A lot of uh, rough stuff going on between the record company, Chrysalis Records, and uh, Vinny and Robert. How pretty, all that pretty how, shifty. How all that came to be, and you're gonna, it's a lot. You're gonna hear all the machinations about what goes on behind the scenes with uh, a character like Vinny Vincent and what Robert's thoughts are at the time. So uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. What do you say? Let's do it. He was framing this to you as we're going to be a band, and then yeah, yeah, and, and then yeah, and then from that, so then it went, so so then after he came back from that, that's when we went in the studio. Uh huh. Okay. And that's when we went in the studio with Andy Johns, mm -hmm. who oh, worked on um, on Exile in Main Street, worked on Zeppelin. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Andy was just, uh, his brother is Glenn Johns. Uh -huh. He did the Who's Next album. He worked with everybody in yeah. England. He's oh. the most famous rock and roll engineer, I think. And this was the first in, first invasion. And so his brother Andy worked with us. Mm -hmm. and he was uh, quite an experience and. <laughs> lovely guy <laughs> and uh then he andy mixed him and then um vinnie i don't know i didn't hear from Vinny for a while uh -huh. and then i find out um and the way i found out is because he couldn't do anything but call me because chris was told that him that yeah we love the album and everything but uh you know we want robert too right they wanted you to go, where's them. Robert, you know? Mm -hmm. And so now, what did he do? He'd already burned his bridges with me at the very beginning of the whole relationship, you know? Right, right. So I just basically told him to screw off. And so then, um, you know, I was getting calls from him. I was getting calls from his monkey, Dana. And, um, and I was getting calls from, you know, constantly. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, no, no, no. And it just made me mad or just to keep getting bugged by them. And then um, my wife at the time um, was pregnant with my son, Austin. Mm -hmm. And um, I said okay to it because I needed money because of the baby. So I did it for that reason. And what was the vibe like when you went back into this working relationship with him? Um, it, was, it was light. Mm -hmm. It was light. And... He tried to accommodate me in any way he could. I think he was trying to make up for, you know, what he did. And um, so we went in the first day to do vocals on um, on the Invasion album, and uh, he had some, he had a vocal booth mm -hmm. set up. And um, so you walk into this you know, like this big telephone booth, and uh, the whole lining of the inside was Playboy centerfolds. <laughs> So here I am with, uh, you know, like a, a about 50 Playboy centerfolds. For inspiration. You know, microphone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from from the ceiling to each four sides. Yeah, so 
I'm standing in there. And he goes, oh, I thought it would give you inspiration. Oh, okay. And I said, well, yeah, I'm sorry that you had to mess up your uh, Playboy collection. <laughs> well, you... And I said, plus, I think it's going to take a lot more than that to get me off. <laughs> Well, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Dana. Uh, I, I already get a feel for what your feelings are on him. What, what were your, what were your impressions of him when you met him? Well, such a hoodlum. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of an opportunist who kind of makes himself look like he's like Mister Businessman. You know, you walk into the studio and he's got his his feet up on the console and he's reading uh, the Wall Street Journal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's just not, I don't like him. Yeah. I don't like him. I think he ruined, he, he really helped. I think he helped ruin Vinny, too. You think he rubbed off on him a bit? Yeah, because, see, Vinny, unfortunately, wouldn't take control. Vinny just likes to shout out orders to people. And, hey, can you do, do this and do this? And that's what he Dana was. Dana somehow got himself involved as the producer, mm-hmm. where where where. Vinny and I, when we did it, when we were in the studio, we were the producers, and we could have done it ourselves. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. He didn't need Dana. Dana. Dana has no taste. I mean, I wouldn't have him pick out my socks. You know. <laughs> so he um, he was just a just an idiot. Mm-hmm. Just he was just a weird, sleazy vibe. You know, I felt like I was hanging out with a dumpster. Wow. And I didn't like him. I didn't like him. Plus he. He stole the equipment from the recording studio that we were at. Really? I mean, he stole, yeah, he stole the, like a, a half track. I mean, a skull, like a really expensive, you know, like a couple of grand. I mean, it was like, that's grand larceny, you know. And, and then he would call up people like um, Eventide and all these outboard gear uh, recording companies um, and ask for equipment and saying, Oh, I'm working with Vinnie Vincent. We need this and this and this and this. And they would get, they would bring it and give it. And he, and he would just, and Vinnie wouldn't even know he would, he'd bring maybe one thing that he, that he got from all the people that he schmoozed and stole from. Wow. And, and that's all Vinnie's equipment because he used his name. Right. Yeah. And so there was all, there was always stuff going on like that with him. And, and then, uh, and then when I t- when when I uh, left the band and everything, he he's going like, well, you're never gonna, you'll never work in this town again, you know. That's like some freaking stupid Hollywood old movie cliche, you know. <laughs> and so yeah, I was getting like like anonymous letters saying you'll never work in this this uh, town again, and they were coming from somewhere downtown. Mm-hmm. Los Angeles, you know, because it had the mail stamp on it. Sure. And I knew it was coming from him because he was bragging uh, earlier about this band he was producing downtown L.A. You know, it's like, boy, not too hard to put, you know, two and two together. dot to dot and make the picture. Right, exactly. God, so it was just dysfunctional right from the get-go. It was dysfunctional from the get-go. Wow. It's it's. And it's kind of sad and for me. If it wasn't for me being so nice, yeah. there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a Vinnie Vincent album. Wow. Cause when I go through her, oh. Putting the O back in oh. rock. It's just like a... Oh. 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 A hot night. Oh. Yes. 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 Uh. Listening to the Decibel Geek Podcast. Well, you know, the thing is, is yes, you know, there is, appears to be a lot of baggage that comes along with working with Vinnie Vincent, Mm -hmm. but in the end result, Vinnie Vincent's a hell of a musician, a hell of a songwriter, and that first Vinnie Vincent Invasion album, the self-titled debut, is pretty evident of that. Yeah, and I agree, and like, in in, in the next segment, you're going to hear Robert's, basically, his deep thoughts about the, uh, about the album and the making of the album and some of the the interesting things that went on during the making of the album. I wish we could play some of that. Of the album? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go to court. Come on, let's play some of it. No, I don't know about that. All right. But um, Dang it. Uh, 
uh, it's maybe, really good. You well, guys check it well, out. Well, we on played your own. some of it on one of the um, on the listener request show. We oh did, yeah, yeah. We played uh, "Shoot You Full of Love." Oh yeah, that's a right. very romantic title. That's right. Um. So anyway, but yeah, I I love the album. There's a, gr- a lot of great songs on it, and it's it's what's so wonderful about the album is just how over the top and crazy it is. Right. And there I were mean, you got to be able to appreciate it for what it is. It's a you know it's an Ingve Malmsteen type album sort of where you know the guitar virtuosity mm-hmm. is just off the charts. Yeah. You know, and he's it's basically, you know, it's it's one of those guitar show off albums. And yeah. that's kind of what it, what it is. But what makes it what separates it, though, from like the Racer X and the, you know, a lot of the, the technical albums of the time, the songs or the songwriting, because yeah. there's real solid songwriting there. And a lot of these songs on the first invasion album, I would love to hear what some of those would have turned into had Vinny stayed in Kiss and some of those songs would have wound up on the Animal Eyes album. Right, because, you know, in talking about that, like the Ingve Malmsteens and stuff like that, you listen to them, you think, man, that's some killer guitar playing, but mm-hmm. you don't usually think, well, wow, like, that was a great song. Yeah, the songs are not some... You know, the, in it, this, just, you're right, Vinnie Vincent, the songs are really strong, and well Rob, written. And Robert's vocals are just over yeah. the top crazy on it. And, and you know, it's it's an ex- he, his vocals are just as extreme as Vinnie's playing is. Yeah. And which, you know, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but this is just one of those albums where I don't really like a lot of you know shredderific albums that are just nuts on everything but this is one of those where I make an exception you know right I agree with that because there's solid songs in it but yeah in this next segment you're gonna hear Robert's you know stories about what went into making this album and some of the stuff's pretty nutty and some, yeah, this of, ought to be good. some of it's extreme and you're gonna hear about Vinny's battle with the engineer and uh, yeah I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too deep into it because you know we'll let the interview speak for itself but yeah check this out this is the behind the scenes look at what went into making the first Invasion album. Because I, it's one of my favorite records of the 80s, to be honest with you. Um, but, Nothing like it. Oh, it's just, well, yeah, that's a, what I wanted to say. <laughs> Nothing it, like it and, and all the aftermath of it, too. Exactly. <laughs> such bizarre circumstances went into it and went in and even went from that but it just the uh you know a lot of people give you know, slag the album for the over the top guitar playing but i think that's what makes it stand out you know it's it's everything it is everything. over the top and yeah. it is it's it's like the it's the most narcissistic lead <laughs> soloing you'll ever hear sure but that's what's fun to listen to about and also and your vocals are just so huge um now did what was that was that your idea to go with with these super high notes or was Vinny pushing you to do that um a little bit of both i mean i did it because i i i, I had never i it, i have the i ha, i knew i had i have the ability to do that sure obviously yeah. and i never had the chance to do anything like that mm-hmm. um without sounding completely like, you know, a pair of brown shoes with a tuxedo, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was a really, uh, the music was so on 11, so it gave, it balanced out the vocals at 11, you know? Right. So it, it kind of, it made a, a gruesome twosome. Yeah. So you, and I've seen you mention that you thought uh, No Substitute was probably your favorite from that that album yeah i like no substitute because yeah. i got to sing there you know yeah i think that should have easily been a single of course with you in the band would have been nice <laughs> but um yeah, yeah yeah so we go from from you recording all these killer vocals for this album and then the next thing we know mark slaughter is doing the millie vanilli thing with the video and there's no robert so how do we get right. from how do we get from you cutting the tracks to that um well the record uh, we were mixing the record with uh, George Tutko, and that was a real labor, laborious situation. Because mm-hmm. um, Vinny, once again, shooting himself in the foot. I mean, he would just hear George would be working on a mix for like three hours, you know, and getting the balance right and the harmonic tones and, mm-hmm. and the EQ and everything just pristine. And then, you know, Vinny would walk up to the console and sneak up there and move his guitars up. Gosh. You know, just, and just, here this guy's working on something, you know, and the guy just comes up, just throws the guitars up. And it's just like, and, and, and George is going like, what the hell's going on? Am I, you know, my ears are going bad or what's going on? Right. You know, so finally we figure out, and I, you know, I saw him do it, you know, several times too. Wow. You know, he would, I mean, every song he'd do the same thing. 
So, I mean, how many songs are on that record? Uh, ten, I believe. I could be ten. wrong. Yeah. You got ten times that guy would be doing it. For I mean, the, ten songs he did the same thing, and, and many times too. And then George would have to bring it down, and you know, it was just, it was just like, God darn, I've never seen so, so out of control. Well, it's like, why have an engineer if you're going to do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, mix it yourself. Right. Just do it. Make it a DIY you know? thing. Yeah. And and then on top of it, you know, he would record like eight guitars, uh-huh. eight guitar tracks. He had eight separate, eight separate um, stacks of Marshalls, and he and he had them all, when we were first recording them, he had them stacked up in this big, like warehouse, mm-hmm. and it, it was truly. You know, Stonehenge in there. <laughs> straight out of Spinal Tap, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just straight out of Spinal Tap. Yeah. You know, and, and they were all mic'd, and they were all, you know, being recorded at the same time. Which you, all you really need are two of them, uh-huh. and you could and, and you and you get the same sound. Right. But he had to have those eight tracks up there, you know, which was the same sound, the same pump, everything. You know, mm-hmm. it was insane. <laughs> it's just maddening. And it's that maybe the uh, the kiss bigger is better thinking must have rubbed off on him or, uh, earlier on. I don't know. That's um, no, no, because I'm quite sure kiss probably listened to their engineers. Well, one person I never get hear I never hear much about is the manager at the time, George Suet. What can you tell me about? Yeah. What can you tell me about him? Well, George. Um, I didn't like George either. Really? <laughs> George was just not uh, my cup of tea. I don't know. He was like a, a bad Scorsese movie. What do you mean by that? Like as in like a hype man or over the top? Yeah, or? he was. He was. You know, guy from New York. You guys and all that stuff. You know what I mean? He. We were at the uh, photo shoot for the for the album cover for the back cover. Yeah. And uh, probably have heard I hate. Yeah, what was it? Uh, something like uh, posing with three inflatable drag queens. Yeah, <laughs> that's very well put. Exactly. <laughs> Which is interesting. Because and then at the, and then and then at the time they, you know, Benny's one to the guy to the stylist. Oh, uh-huh. gotta do something with Robert's hair, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, oh no, no, just leave it like alone, leave it alone. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I'm sitting down and they're like cutting my hair to look like some fucking poodle, you know. <laughs> and so. I'm just going, oh, fuck, you know, and here I'm with a fucking poodle hairdo with these drag queens. So, anyway, um, that during that session of the, the photo session, George came up to me with a with a telephone book of a contract yeah. and tells me to sign it. Without reading, and, basically. Uh, yeah, without even reading it, anything, <laughs> and he's saying, you know, uh, trust me, trust me. Oh, sure. And I'm saying, you know, I, I don't think so, and I'm going to have it, you know, I'm going to take it to a lawyer. He goes, well, that's going to take too much time. And so I'm going like, oh, well, tough. Yeah. You know? So um, he got all irate and flipped out. And I just basically said, look, you know, we might be at this, might be in the same camp, but, you know, I'm not, you're not the flag I'm saluting here. Right. I said, my, my, my uh, only allegiance here is with Vinny mm-hmm. and between he and I. And that's it. I said, if you want to manage everybody else, you go ahead. I'm not interested. Right. I wonder what happened to him though, because he kind of just dropped off the radar after the uh, Kiss reunion. You know, he he was managing Ace he and claimed, Peter. I think I heard that he claims that Vinny, through stress, gave him cancer. I know he he was managing Ace and Peter when Kiss did the reunion, and then out of then he just sort of disappeared. You can't really find anything about him anywhere. Yeah. Well, maybe he's sleeping with the fishes. I don't know. <laughs> so so you won't sign this contract, and that leaves them. So you basically so, uh, called yeah, their bluff. So then he, um, I find out later that um, that he told Chrysalis that he had the whole band signed and tied up. And then um, they found out that I didn't sign the contract. Mm-hmm. And they got really pissed off at him. So this is twice he, now. Because he lied to them. Yeah. You know, because this whole thing is like, you know, Chrysalis is, wants to be contractually in, you know, um, involved mm-hmm. with the whole with the whole project, you know, especially Bill Beat Singer. Right. So they got pissed off at him, and uh, they called me up. Chrysalis called me up and said, uh, 
you know, we want to we want to sign you to the to Chrysalis, and um, so it was just signed with Chrysalis. So so you you know we we have you contractually involved with the Vinnie Vincent project, and we're not going to pay you anything. Oh, what a great deal that is. Yeah, so I said, well, I'm sorry, unless you pay me, you know, I mean, you paid Vinny. Yeah. And, um, you know, you've, you've, you've put out so much money on this thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like <laughs> the, the most important element, and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to give me a hello. So um, I just said, uh, said no. Mm-hmm. And um, on the other line kind of was a dead silence, and then they said, and somebody goes, well, we'll just have to take your voice off the, the album. And I said, well, you go ahead and do what you have to do. And I said, for one thing, you're going to have to go in and re-record everything, remix everything. You're going to have to go through the whole, you're going to have to open up the big box of spiders, mm-hmm. and you're going to have, you're just going to have the biggest headache you ever could imagine. And I said, so you go ahead and do what you have to do. And then I hung up. So then um, they released the album, and I'm on there. And so uh, that was it on that. So, the, when so, the, then, so, so then I guess, here's the way to get to this. So I get a phone call a couple of, like a month or something later or so, and somebody says, oh, they're going to play the new Vinnie Vincent uh, uh, video on MTV. Mm-hmm. I don't know, that's interesting. <laughs> Is there going to be an empty mic stand sitting there? Right? Yeah, I said, this is going to be really something. So, you know, like... You know, in about a half an hour, they're going to play it, or an hour, you know, so, you know, half an hour goes by, 35 minutes goes by, you know, 10 minutes till launch shot, you know, launch time, and I um, turn on the TV, put on the MTV, and here comes, what, Boys Are Gonna Rock? Mm-hmm. Here comes Boys Are Gonna Rock with some fucking guy wearing, what, is he wearing, um, he's wearing panties outside, the, outside his uh, leather pants. I believe it's some sort of lacy, frilly thing. I don't remember exactly. Yeah, he's got panties. He's got women's panties on and the outside of his... I'm just going, oh, fuck me. Yeah. You know, this is a whoa. And then they got his lip syncing to my voice and everything. I'm just going, this guy, a, this guy looks like he's straight out of, um, like, some with a Chippendale or something, you know, like a bad with a bad wig on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's bad. So did you... And it was, it was horrible. Yeah. So then... Um, I had a friend who's a lawyer, knew a lawyer, and they sued Chrysalis, and I won. So that was really the first Millie Vanilli. Exactly. That was before Millie Vanilli. I mean, I should get some a medal for it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were the pioneer. <laughs> yeah, I'm the pioneer. I broke that. <laughs> Unbeknownst to you, but yeah, you were the pioneer. <laughs> um, <laughs> were you, well, were you, was your jaw just on the floor when this came on? Um, or were you not surprised? I wasn't surprised. Really, I wasn't surprised, and I, I don't know how that guy can even live with himself even to this day. Well, I was going to ask you because I I've seen you mention in a I saw you mention in another interview that um you you never have you did you end up checking out the second album they did with him? No, I've never heard it. Really, not even out of curiosity. Um, I think I mean I maybe heard something like I. I on YouTube or something like that. Right. But that's about it. I, I never, no, I've never listened to it. And now, Deep Thoughts with Gene Simmons. Sometimes I wonder why in the hell that itsy bitsy spider kept trying to climb up that damn water spout. Stupid ass spiders. That's why they don't have space flight or tacos or gymnasiums or huge books named Monster. See me right now. All right, welcome back. Has it gotten crazy enough for you yet, Aaron? What do you think about being back in the world of of Vinnie Vincent? I mean, it's all informative and it's all entertaining, and I can see why, you know, so many of the listeners really want to hear this Vinnie Vincent stuff, you know, and to me, you know, Vinnie Vincent's a, you know, he was in Kiss. He's a hell of a guitar player. You know, I'm a fan of his, mm-hmm. you know, but the response that these get, I never really quite understood 
until I really started looking at it and really started listening to some of the old episodes, and this really shines a lot of light on things too. Well, it's, you know, somebody somebody commented the other day on Facebook that they went back and listened to the first two, and they're like, "It's like a rock and roll soap opera." I guess that's about the best <laughs> the best Pretty way much. you can you can describe it. And you know, somebody should be giving Vinnie Vincent a reality TV show. He's got a rabid fan base. I mean, and like I wasn't a super big fan until I started researching stuff. You know, I was initially going to make this a book project. Well, people and, like things that are mysterious. Well, and I, I, know? but then I started listening to the music and I was, cause I never gave it much of a chance in the eighties. I was just into more straight ahead what was popular at the time. Yeah. And then I went back and started listening to this. I was like, this is some really good stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and I became a fan and I'm still a fan, but, um, he's got some of the most devoted fans you will ever find. I agree. Especially you know? after all the things that have gone through with the box set and everything. And we'll get into that later. But, um, as anyone who, if you don't know what happened with the invasion, Robert, you know, obviously had a stalemate with them. Mark Slaughter goes, it takes over the vocals. They record, they go ahead and record an album with Mark Slaughter called All Systems Go. Which was moderately successful. It was. It got, they got had, a bit of a push. Uh, they had a song on the, uh, what was it, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 soundtrack, I think? I think it was 4. 4? Yeah. Love, Love Kills, I think it was called, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, Love Kills. And then they had another song called that, that time of year that did okay. Yeah. But they never got a big push from the record company. And if, if you... I think I've went over this on one of the other episodes on Vinny. Um, for a lot of people seem to think that there's stories about Vinny running the credit line that Chrysalis Records gave him out That's the, up the, the wazoo. That's from the Slaughter song, right? Yeah, the Slaughter song, Burning Bridges, That's if you it. if you believe what you've heard, is um, supposedly written about Vinny. I don't know for a fact, and I'm not stating it's a fact. I think it's a pretty unspoken thing that everybody knows that that right. song is about Vinny Vincent. So the rumor is that he ran their credit line up so bad that the record company was like, well, forget you, we're not going to push you. <laughs> And then there was a lot of dysfunction in the band at the time. And, um, you know, a couple of man members have alluded to stuff, but never gotten into detail. But basically, from what I've heard, that by the time the tour started for that album, the band was pretty much over. Like, they, yeah. they just fulfilled the dates they had, but they were, like, not talking to each other or anything. And things fall apart again. And then Chrysalis starts, from what I've read, uh, starts wanting to push Mark Slaughter and the other guys and yeah. cut Vinny out of the picture. Now, w why that is, you know, you decide. You do your research. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can listen to what guys like Robert Fleischman are telling you and things that you've heard on the podcast before and the stories and the songs and Slaughter and yeah. pretty much put two and two together. I, I mean, but you, we'll leave that to you we'll to leave decide. It to you. I mean, there's two sides to every story, and I wish Vinny would come out with his. Absolutely. We'd love to have, again, you know, we say it every time we talk about Vinny Vincent, would love to have the guy on the show. We would yeah. treat him with the utmost respect and let the guy tell his side of the story because he deserves a chance to tell it. Yeah, so so the invasion breaks up after all systems go. Yeah, and too to, bad. They were pretty good. Well, to flash forward to, you know, just this past year after all the legal wrangling and everything went down, Vinny released a like a press release statement stating that, he was want, wanting to plan to do to redo All Systems Go with Robert singing because, and according to the press release, he didn't like Mark Slaughter's vocals and he always wanted Robert. But hmm. that runs completely counter to the story that was going on in '86 when they got Mark Slaughter in the band. Because at the time, if you don't know the story, they claim that Mark Slaughter sent in a demo tape around the time of the first Invasion album of his voice, uh -huh. and they loved it so much, but there was no information to get in touch with him. So they hired <laughs> back before Facebook. Kids. Yeah, but so they hired Fleischman out of necessity or whatever, and they wow. and then they claimed after Fleischman left that they spent ten grand on phone calls trying to find this kid that sent a demo tape, and that's how they got Mark Slaughter. So which is it? Do back you, do back you, before free long distance kids. Yeah. So so <laughs> so you believe that? Do you believe Vinny from '86 or do you believe Vinny from 2011? Because that's completely, con you know, contradictory. You've brought me into this world, Chris, of Vinny Vincent madness, and I don't know what to believe anymore. Well, neither do I. But <laughs> um, so in the next segment, you're going to hear Robert's take on that statement that was was released last year. Did Vinny actually contact him to record that album again, and what you know, where do things stand with that? It'd be interesting. And also, you're going to hear about an album that never got released because he started working robert started working with vinnie again in 89 after the invasion broke up again perils of the rock and roll business and if you don't know what album that is it was loosely called either guitars from hell or guitar mageddon and you're going to hear my talk with robert about you know the songs that he remembers and all the, the wacky stories behind that period and what led robert to finally walk away for good from vinnie sometimes you just got to wash your hands and walk away <laughs> I'm sure someone 
probably told you last year where uh, Vinny posted something online saying something like he would like to re-record that album with you singing. Do you remember this? Yeah, that was after he had the incident with his, with his wife, wife and the dogs and everything. He was trying to make uh, lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was your response to that when you heard that? I just felt like, uh, you know, here's a guy with a bad situation on his hands and mm -hmm. he's trying to, he's just dangling on a rope, you know? Right. Maybe it was an attempt to divert attention, possibly. Exactly. Yeah. So he never actually contacted it was, you. It, I mean, it was so obvious. Right. No, no. Yeah. You think it was I more just uh, lip service at the time? Absolutely, like everything else. <laughs> well, I, you know, after such a horrible experience with the first album, I'm surprised that you wound up working with him again around 89. What what led to that? Well, he came up to me, and he was just kind of, you know, knowing that he screwed himself with the Chrysalis situation, and he had another opportunity. Mm-hmm to do a record, and I guess he must have told, uh, I think he was with Epitaph? I'm not sure. He started off with? I he, he, I, he got a deal with Epitaph Records, I think, or something like that. Oh, okay. I think that's the name of it. it I, I could be wrong. But he got um, he got a second chance. Mm -hmm. Some record company gave him a second chance to go in. And so I think I went in there and did um, Rocks on Fire. Uh-huh. And another song, I think. I think one was called Nuke It, wasn't it? Yeah, Nuke It and, um, and some other stuff, I think. Well, there's one that got leaked. Rocks on Fire was complete. I mean, that was one that, you know, all uh, I made sure everything was vocally the way I wanted it to be. You know? Right, right. And there's some other ones that there's titles, for, although there's one I heard with some, some, it sounds like your vocals, called Heavy Metal Poontang. Do you remember that one? Yeah, yeah, I think so. That one got leaked like this past year, and it sounds like you... And then there's there's other titles out there that I don't think have ever been substantiated, like Brain Saw, Cock Teaser, uh, Get the Let Out. Um, yeah, I remember Get the Let Out. Okay, and then Shocker, you remember that? Yeah, I remember Shocker, yeah. Oh, okay. Do you still have any of the lyrics for those songs? No. No? no I never... I never uh -huh. The only song I ever wrote lyrics for was um, Do You Want to Make Love? Oh, okay. And um, an invasion. Oh, okay, um, got you. So he, I worked on that. So he wrote most of. But I, I wrote all the lyrics for um, "Do You Want Me Glove." Oh, okay, great song by the way. Um, Thanks. I think so. Now that about the whole album. <laughs> now that project you did with him in the late '80s, um, it's gone. You know. Okay, it, so so we're in we're in the studio recording this thing, uh -huh. and it's kind of, we we just got through doing "Rocks on Fire" and another song. And he was all jacked up. He was like, ah, oh, rock's on fire, man. But then he was just like jacked on that song. Uh -huh. So he uh, started calling up other um, record companies. And uh, he was basically trying to get other record companies to uh, buy him out of his um, his contract. Yeah. He was trying to get a better deal. And here, here these people gave him a second chance. Yeah, and that's... here these people have just, you know, given money again to go to the studio to do this whole thing. And, and, you know, and here, you know, here I am again, you know, just in this leaky ass Titanic boat, you know. <laughs> and he's, he's on the phone doing this. And I'm just going, you can't do this, dude, you know. Just look at... And so I just, um, I just sick and tired of it all. So that was sort, of, sort then, of the last straw then, basically. Yeah, that was kind of like the last straw. And then... Um, and then the record company wanted to come down and hear the stuff, and he wouldn't let him come down. And then uh, the record company found out, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're if you're going to be pitching the record, and uh, you know, and if they're thinking about doing it, they're going to contact their lawyers. Sure. And their lawyers are going to contact you know Van, the record company. Yeah, it's going to so get. It's going to get. Then was that, then that's when the shit hit the fan. I just, it's just so, it's just bizarre how oblivious, I mean, he had to have known that that was going to get found out. I just don't understand how, why he would have done that. I really don't. Record companies are not, are, are smarter than that, you know? <laughs> well, he didn't think so. He thought he was smarter than all of them. That just blows me away. I mean, after all that he had been through and everything, and then the hor the horrible breakup with the invasion and everything, to go and then cut off your nose to spite your face with when you do get a deal, I mean, I can obviously see why you decided to just go ahead and walk away at that point. Yeah. 
do you remember the last conversation you had during that time with him? Oh, he wrote a letter to me saying, you know, that I was, that I sabotaged it and all this, that I was sabotaged it and that, um, you know, at that time I was like, at that time I was just, I had to be, I didn't have to go to the studio, but I felt like I had to be there for some reason because I had to be there to, to, per- to protect himself from himself. Right. You know, and, 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 and the engineers and everything. And, and, and I had to be like the, I had to be the in between, between him and the engineer and all that stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, and after a while, after hanging there and doing all that shit, I just go, fuck this, man. I'm just going to roll myself a big old fucking joint and start smoking <laughs> in that damn studio, you know? <laughs> so I, I just sit there and roll one joint after another and just sit there. And, and Vinny's going, oh, well, can you blow, blow a little bit of that? I think I'm feeling a little wee, whoopy or something like that, you know? <laughs> like something really like some uh, some girly expression. He wasn't partaking. So then, I, so then I'd just take a big puff and just blow it at him, you know? And, just, and then, and then, um, and then you know, I'm getting tipsy, you know? <laughs> it's just going to oh, fuck. And so, uh, so then he wrote this letter saying, you know, that I sabotaged it and, and that I that I was smoking pot in the studio and and I don't really want I didn't like that and all this stuff and oh, it was just like it was just like such a eighth grade girl fucking letter, kind of grasping at straws basically. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. because of you know what he obviously did. He was just trying to somehow give himself justify his mm. ethnicity. So this was sort of a fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me situation at the time. Yeah, and then I'll blow pot and straight race. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you probably saw the, the ship sinking not around that time with, you know, this is just not going to turn into anything, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're there, you know, and you're, you're getting there, you got the life, life vest on and everything, and the guy's still, you know, punching fucking holes in the dinghy. And well, then, then I, he did the thing with the box set stuff. Yeah, that was. And then I was getting, I was getting um, emails from people, you know, where's my box set? And, you know, where, where can I find Vinny? And, Have you sp- talked to Vinny? When's the last time you spoke to Vinny? You know, I was like getting inundated with all this. I'm going like, what the fuck is going on, you know? So you were. And I find out that, you know, he, he abscanded with people's money. Yeah. One positive. And I'm just, you know, I. And, you know, I say all this stuff about him, but, you know, in my heart, I, I, I love the guy. Right. I just, I just, I, I, it's like there's a part of me that just, I still feel so sorry for him, you know? Right. Well, I mean, I wouldn't be... And, uh, then, uh, and then, uh, and, uh, and, you know, under the same umbrella, it's like I just don't want to fucking kick his ass. It's a real love-hate thing. Yeah, it's kind of a real love-hate thing, but, you know, it's like, it's like enough is enough. Well, you just want to be like, dude, just... Please get your head on straight and do something. I don't know. It's just yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. I think I just I want nothing but the best for the guy. I mean, it's like no, it's never too late to turn turn it all around and do something. But it will never, it will never happen because the minute you hand him a dollar, that ego is a billion dollars worth. Around here, you know, we know Vinnie Vincent as being from, uh, we know Robert Fleischman as being involved with Vinnie Vincent. Mm -hmm. But most people, as they would say, even on, I think what you said on Wikipedia, they say most people know Robert Fleischman as being a member of Journey. Yeah. But most you know, of our listeners, I don't think so. I didn't. I would have never known that. Yeah, it's an interesting story, and you know, for those that don't know, um, Robert was with the band for about nine months as their singer, right before they got uh, Steve Perry as their singer, and he didn't actually record with them, but he wrote with them. Yeah, and he wrote some pretty key songs for Journey as the, well. Well, the biggest one is "Wheel in the Sky." He he wrote that with them. That's probably their best song, I think. It's it's up there. That's right. Up and there. Um, it's. And 
um, it's funny because Robert's got a new project now, and, and you know he's been out of the music scene for quite a while since working with Vinny, and he's got a new band now called The Sky, and The Sky came about um, well as a result of one thing Vinny related, one thing Journey related. One thing Vinny related is the drummer for The Sky is a guy named Andre LaBelle who played with Robert with Vinny um, during the Guitars from Hell recording, mm -hmm. and you'll hear Robert's thoughts on how Vin how Andre was treated. Andre was a big fan of of Vinny, and you're, it's an interesting story about how the treatment of Andre. But anyway, all um, the seed that sparked his interest in being in music again was um, the Journey Rock Walk of Fame induction that they had recently where um, they had the ceremony and he was included with that. That's pretty cool. And then they had a show that night, a packed show at the House of Blues to celebrate and Journey, he was just going to watch the show and Journey asked him to come up, come up on stage and uh, sing Wheel in the Sky for them. Sweet. And you'll, as you'll hear in the conversation, this kind of made him think, hmm, I miss doing this. I bet. And that's After something like that. And as you've heard in the music all throughout the show, this is all stuff from the sky. So right. we're, you guys can check that out. we got the website yeah, for you. You need to go to the, the theskyofficial.com. And the reason you want to go to that site, you go to theskyofficial.com slash merch, is because Robert wanted me to pass on to all of our listeners that if you buy the CD through that website, through that link, and we'll have a link in the show notes, he will personally autograph your copy heck yeah so, so you know if you're a fan a little inside information for the decibel geeks that's right he'll he'll sign it himself and send it to you so <laughs> not everybody's going to do that for you but no. robert fleischman will so yeah check that out but um yeah go to the skyofficial.com slash merch m-e-r-c-h and you will be able to pick that up all right well this is the last segment of the show you're going to hear all about the sky you're going to hear a little bit more about vinnie you're going to hear about robert opening up for van halen on the van halen 2 tour that's awesome i didn't know that either so yeah so Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. Enjoy the last segment of the show. I know one positive thing that happened from the guitars from hell, guitar Mageddon, whatever you want to call it, session was you got to meet one of your lifelong friends and Andre LaBelle around that time, right? Oh, uh, yeah. And, I got to meet Andre. And... Uh, <laughs> who was playing drums on all the stuff. So uh, what was it like working with him through all of that madness at the time? Well, it was like um, Vinny was rude to him. And I would tell Vinny, man, you can't talk to somebody like that. You can't do this. And he was just so rude to, to Andre. And Andre was just, you know, would do pretzels just for the opportunity of doing this. Mm -hmm. Because Vinny, I mean, because Andre, he grew up listening to Kiss. And a funny story is, uh, Andre saw Kiss in Virginia one time when he was a little, when he was really super young, and he saw Vinny, mm -hmm. and he he just felt like I'm gonna I want to play with that guy someday, and he did. Yeah. And he did, and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it wasn't the greatest experience, but it was an experience for him. Yeah. And I um, and I was just kind of like um, I was Andre's big brother. You know, mm. protecting him from Vinny, basically. Mm. And he's a great drummer, great guy, funny as heck, and um, he's in my band right now. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I've, uh, as I told you the other day, I I, I got the uh, MP3 version of the CD and I've I, I've been listening to it. It's really good, and I want to say it's, and I'm not just kissing up. I think it's, it has a real live, organic feel to it. It doesn't sound like there's a million overdubs on this. Exactly. That's how it was recorded live. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I will. I don't think I will ever go in the studio and piece an, another record again. Mm -hmm. I I just refuse to do it. I will never do that again. Well, now it's just like live, and that's what you get. You get the magic. You don't get some fucking sterile, digitized, you know, homogenized version of a song. This it's real there. You know, because it was recorded live. Those are like either the first or second takes, and that was it, you know. And um, I saw you mention in another interview with my friend John Parks from Legendary Rock Interviews that you, um, the uh, Journey Rock Walk of Fame induction, kind of gave you the, the 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 juice to to want to do this again. So yeah, um, it did. So so how does it feel to to be out there again doing this? Well, well, you know, let's say like after. Um, uh, after uh, Journey and I received the uh, Hollywood um, star, uh, they played at the House of Blues, mm -hmm. and um, that was all sold out. And um, 
during sound check, um, you know, ask me if I, I want you got you know, because I want you to come up and do Wheel and Sky with us tonight. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, really? <laughs> I thought I was going to just watch the show, you know. That's great. And so um, I was really nervous because um, I hadn't been up on stage in a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, it was just um, a great honor. Yeah. And so uh, they introduced me, and I went up there, and I sang Wheel in the Sky, and I just kind of looked at everybody and looked down at my feet and all the people there and, and just being on, you know, a nice sound system and just, you know, sounding huge mm-hmm. um i just felt like god i forgot how this was you know yeah so i just kind of got the whole um brain spinning again mm-hmm. and um a couple of days later after um uh, andre called me you know and um i was talking to him and i said you know i really want to put a band together and so he basically just said, look, I know some really good people out here in Virginia. I want to be in your band. I'm going, yeah, yeah. Well, you got to move out to California. <laughs> and um, he said, no, you got to come out here. And I got some really great people. So I went out there. Mm-hmm. I spent a week in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And um, I just fell in love with uh, the sound mm-hmm. that we were producing. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> then after a week, I went back home, California. And so we're on the phone, you know just going, how are we going to make this work and everything? And then a couple of a month or so later, I have a friend who lives in Vegas who had a sound stage and um, flew everybody out to Vegas. And we spent a week out in Vegas just playing in this huge sound stage. And um, everyone went back home. And then it was just for, you know, two months, just how, how are we going to make this work? And uh, finally, I, um, my wife, Michelle, and I talked about it. And uh, we moved from California to Richmond, Virginia. That's a big step to take for a, a new project like that, because I mean, you know, you've been in Cali- yeah, right. California for a long time, hadn't you? Oh yeah, I'm a native. Yeah, so I mean, all the way across the country. So you, I mean, you must have really felt quite a spark from this project to do that. Yeah, I did, and that's why it's so important to me. Mm-hmm. This whole, this whole guy album. How'd you come you up know, with the name I, The Sky? <laughs> I just. I wanted the uh, I wanted something like the Who, mm-hmm. the Move, the something. You know, I just wanted like very sh- small amount of letters, and um, and I just liked all those English bands because that's I just love uh, you know English uh, rock and roll. Oh yeah, and I can hear it in the influence of what you guys are doing. You know, I've been I've been I I, I grew up with a cousin who was eight years older than I, and he listened to all the all the uh, British invasion stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So he turned me on to all that stuff. So, you know, the very first stuff I ever listened to and, you know, presents were, um, you know, Beatle records and 45s. And, and then um, I had a tape recorder and I used to I used to turn on my tape recorder and turn on Beatle records and uh, sing along to them and just sing until I could, until I blended into them. And, um, and then I would listen to myself, and, and then I'd see, oh, I'm not, I'm kind of flat here. I'm not doing that quite right, and you know, go back and re-record it again, and sing along with them, see if I could blend right in there. And um, so I just, that's how I kind of learned how to sing by laying on a, a tape recorder and singing along with the early days people. of s- scratch vocals, right? Pardon? The early days of scratch vocals for you, basically. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, at the age of 13, I heard myself on on tape. You know, because a lot of people go in, maybe it's like they're like 18 years old and maybe, you know, back then, let's say, and they heard themselves for the first time in a recording studio and they're going, shit, is that me? That doesn't sound like me. I can't do that. You know, they start feeling weird, insecure, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, for me, I just kind of skipped all that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You worked it out on your own. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, before I let you go real quick, let me ask you, um, do you have any interesting uh uh, memories of when you uh, opened up for Van Halen on that Van Halen 2 tour? I think that's the perfect string when I, when I, I did Perfect Stranger for Aeros Director. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Anthony, Michael Anthony, mm-hmm. he uh, used to go, yeah, man, I like, cause I like, I like screwing chicks to your uh, song Ace in the Hole. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty what? Yeah. Pretty what? So then, and then, you know, I, I was always it was always cool because when I was on stage and then Van Halen would come in like halfway during my, my set mm-hmm. and uh, they would stand on the side and they'd watch me 
until I was, you know, ready to get off. And, uh, you know, I'd walk with them backstage, you know, after I just got off. And they're going, yeah, man. Eddie's going, yeah, I wish we had a singer like you. Like that. And I'm going like, what? You know? <laughs> so, you know, it's like, but then David never, at the entire tour, he never said one word to me, I don't think. Really? Yeah, he never said one word to me. Mm. But the rest of the guys, mm. I actually saw, had, I mean, after the tour and everything, I ran into uh, Alex at uh, at the Hard Rock Cafe in uh, L.A. And we, you know, saw each other there and we, we had lunch together and, you know, talked about shit and, yeah, and once in a while, I used to see Anthony. I mean, um, Michael. Michael. Yeah. And uh, I called him Anthony. <laughs> and um, and but I never um, and I never got to see uh, Eddie yeah. running around. Him. Have you got to hear the new record? No, uh. no. I, 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 I listen to you know different kinds of music. I don't listen to that kind of music. I never really did. You more of a were putting your toe in the water, so to speak. Well, you know, I was just really kind of a real experimental type kind of guy, you know, I, I kind of came from that mindset, like, you know, like meet the Beatles to revolver, you know, just that whole thing of everything experimenting, you know, not just staying in one genre. Right. And just, you know, beating, riding that horse to death. Right. You know, because I got into like, I did a solo record called uh, Dreaming in Tongues, which is with acoustic guitars and cellos and some very organic sounding, you know. Uh, a lot of the kodos and string instruments and, and things like that, and uh, and I've done electronic music, did an ambient music, an ambient record also, and uh, I did the Look at the Dream, and then I did that horrible one for um, for Frontier Records. But you, so you've you've bounced around quite a bit with genres, which I mean, I guess that that keeps it interesting for you because the Vinny thing is definitely it's way outside of what you've done on other stuff, obviously. Yeah, you know, it's like. The Vinny thing was sort of like if you're a painter, you got the chance to get a big bucket of paint and throw it on the canvas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a that's a very well that's very well put. I would have to agree. You know, because yeah. you know, I mean, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I know how to do landscapes. I can do portraits and everything, but I never got to throw a big bucket of paint. You know, and just go wild, and that was it. Yeah, you, and that was the opportunity. That's pushing the envelope to the extreme for a, a voice. Yeah. Like, were, were you very... Little did I know, I'd be get, I'd have that paint all over me all my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and here I am bringing it back up again. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's fantastic stuff, and um, I really love the the sky stuff, and I, I appreciate you taking some time to talk with me tonight. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, is, is there is there any song in particular off the album uh, that uh, you would like me to spin on the show? I guess everybody everybody likes Boomerang. Love seems that. Like. And people like Time and uh, All I Want. And I like Revelation, actually. You want to go with that one? And, I, and, and, I, and, I, and my favorite one, actually, is um, A Sunshine. I really appreciate you taking some time with me. It's, it's been really enlightening to, to hear your side of, of all of this stuff. After saying it all, you know, he's a brilliant guitar player, mm -hmm. great songwriter. I can I lay a riff down like nobody else and but that's as far as it goes Somewhere between 